well. Um, and so you know, after the talk, we'll reopen the gallery um, so you can um, uh, wallow in the beauty of Walt's art yet again. <laughs> um, so before I have the great pleasure of introducing the speaker, uh, just a couple quick announcements about some upcoming programs. There's a lot of information about some of our fall programs and beyond out here on the table, and you can ask any of the staff members here. I just was gonna highlight a couple things um, which are sort of new to the public eye for the most part. One is on September 5th, there's a new flyer that's back there. Um, I think what's gonna be a really exciting um, and really probably provocative program about the ecology of this area uh, will be co-presented by Dr. Lisa Floyd Hanna, who is our science director and faculty emeritus at Prescott College, um, and Dr. Dave Huffman, who is at the Ecological Restoration Institute in Flagstaff, will be presenting um, on the fire history and historical stand reconstruction of the Mogollon Highlands Ponderosa Pine. Uh, simply translated, that means what is this place supposed to look like? And, and what does that mean for how we should be living here? And um, they're gonna be presenting a lot of the most recent sort of cutting edge research, some of which may not lead to the conclusions that you might expect. Um, so also uh, later in September, a, a newly announced program, uh, Tobias Corwin uh, will be leading a program on the natural history of fire, food, and shelter in the Mogollon Highlands, basically how to survive and how to prosper living off the land in this, in the, you know, knowing the natural history of this region. And then finally, um, I thought I would mention again, um, some of you have heard already, we are, are, one of our biggest undertakings to date is uh, a national confluence, we're calling it a conference, which will be over at a retreat center near Sedona in the first week of November. It's called Reciprocal Healing, Nature, Health, and Wild Vitality. It'll be bringing together naturalists, psychologists, and, and medical practitioners, and, and all sorts of other people, artists, uh, educators, and so on, to try to focus together on how to look at how the healing of ourselves and the healing of the natural world are intricately connected. I think it's gonna be really exciting. It's about half full already with people from all over North America and beyond. Again, if you have any questions, talk to any of the staff members here. Uh, the, with that said, I'll move on to the, to the highlight of the evening. It's my great pleasure to um, introduce our speaker who's, uh, of course, well known to most of you in the room, Walt Anderson, my dear longtime friend and colleague. Um, uh, we worked together at, for 25 years, I believe, at Prescott College. Actually. Even even longer than that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. In fact, one of my claims to fame, I was on the search committee that hired Walt. Hey. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, um, so um, the tagline of the Natural History Institute is integrating art, science, and humanities. We probably could have saved a few words and just said, Walt. <laughs> um, because Walt does indeed integrate art, science, and humanities into all of his work. He's, a, he's an uh, a, a exceptional field biologist and, and natural historian. Uh, he's uh, a wonderful artist, with, uh, and both in terms of painting and in, in photography, as many of you know. Um, he's a writer, and so on. So, so in many ways, Walt exemplifies what this institution is all about. So without uh, further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Walt Anderson. Thanks, Tom. Well, it's a delight to see all of you here. Uh, so many friends, it's, a, it's like a reunion. It's really wonderful for me. And uh, I couldn't think of a better place to have my coming out as an artist in Prescott than here at the Natural History Institute. As Tom said, this is what natural history is all about, and that's why I'm here. And uh, it, I'll get into a little bit of my personal history so you find out why nobody knows that I'm an artist until fairly recently, but I'll get into that during the thing. So we'll start here now, and uh, we'll have time for some questions at the end, and then I do invite you to come and check things out in the gallery. I also have some books up here that I've illustrated in one way or the other. I'll mention them during the talk a little bit, too. 
Okay, so here we go. So we probably ought to start out with the definition of one of the terms of the title, what is art? And uh, Wikipedia, which is the source of all knowledge, of course. <laughs> well, there's many definitions of art, but Wikipedia has a fairly decent one. It's a diverse range of human activities in creating, that word is kind of important, visual, auditory, or performing artifacts, which we can call artworks, expressing the author's imaginative, conceptual ideas or technical skill, or both, intended to be appreciated for their beauty or emotional power. And I would say, oh no. What happened? Maybe I have to, there we go. Okay. These little buttons are a little bit tricky. I would say that's exactly what a naturalist is. A naturalist is an artist because as David Cavanyar wrote, a naturalist is an interpreter, one who can translate the complex language of nature into the vocabulary of the common person. He had man, but I changed it to be politically correct. <laughs> who can reach out to us from the heart of the natural world and lead us in. It's all about interpreting and inspiring people to learn. A naturalist cultivates and invites informed imagination. So think about that. You need to have some knowledge, but then you need to use your imagination. And what facilitates seeing more, sensing connections, and translating nature's messages into deeper levels of awareness, understanding, and appreciation. Well, a naturalist is motivated multiple ways. I say by joy and by love because there is joy as we search for understanding in the natural world. And of course, love for that natural world that supports us. It's part of biophilia, the love of life that you should be familiar with. And natural history is an art form. Like other arts, its messages are, quote, as is said in the definition from Wikipedia, intended to be appreciated for their beauty or emotional power. Here's some of my animal behavior students studying and glorying in the wisdom of ants. So then the other word is, what is conservation? Miriam Webster says it's, there's several definitions, of course a careful preservation and protection of something, especially plan management of a natural resource to prevent exploitation, destruction, or neglect. So it is a, is a caretaking type of function. Natural resource is a bit, little bit of a loaded term because it's very anthropocentric, it's a very human thing. And we don't necessarily conserve things strictly for our purposes, but also for their intrinsic values. So, as many of you know, we save what we love, whatever it be, our relationships, our house, or anything, we save it because we love it. And so the intersection of art and conservation is love. So I'm gonna provide a little bit of personal history here. Nobody's ever seen these pictures before. Hopefully they'll never see them again. <laughs> well, I'm almost three years old in the picture on the left. I had big feet even then. And uh, there's me 70 years later. And so there's a little bit of history behind there. Nothing arises de novo. Uh, experience is what gets you to that place. And so I want to talk a little bit about my experience, so why I'm a naturalist. Oh, this, that little bump down there. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Of course, I don't have any pictures of when I was a child up there, what it was like. But these are fairly recent shots of Mount Baker and Puget Sound up north of Seattle and uh, the wonderful trees and, and the wildlife that you see there and the lush vegetation. This is a fecund landscape because of the rainfall, the long summer days, and so forth. Things grow very lushly. If you look at the truck on the, on the right there, if you leave your vehicle out for over a week, <laughs> it, nature takes over. So Mother Nature is in power up in there. Tom knows it quite well. And uh, there's a lovely slime mold. And of course, from a very young age, I was a nature boy, and I was really infatuated with all the wildlife that I saw around there. My family would go out on Sunday afternoons and look for deer, as many deer as we could find on Komodo Island. But uh, we were in bald eagle country. I used to see them as I walked along the beaches in the driftwood, look up in the trees and see bald eagles, herons, and of course the ubiquitous gulls. And that you see at the top there, that's uh, where I grew up is one of the wintering areas for thousands of snow geese. They actually nest on Wrangell Island in Siberia and come to that area to winter. So I grew up with these things and they inspired me. 
aesthetically and uh, every other way. Well, I suppose aesthetically mostly. That's really what's drawn me into this. Well, after high school, I went on to Washington State University for my undergraduate work. Uh, I spent my summers as a student trainee with the Fish and Wildlife Service on refuges in various western states. Uh, my first refuge was the National Bison Range in Montana, and I didn't have a camera. And I missed so many wonderful opportunities to photograph wild animals there. So the next year, I bought a used camera in a pawn shop and started out in 1966. Uh, so I had these wonderful biological experiences, really had no art training or background other than cartooning as a kid. But then uh, in 1968, when I was going to head off to study sage grouse for a PhD at the University of Montana, I got drafted and spent two years in the Army, got to spend a year in Vietnam. And uh, that was a you know, formative experience. And I survived it really because of my love of nature and birds and things like that. The sight of a bird flying by or the sound of, a, of the whistle of a bird is what kept me going through that time. And I don't think I got too messed up by Vietnam and stayed out of trouble, basically. <laughs> And then after that, uh, I came back, and rather going right into graduate school, I worked at Malheur Refuge again as a wildlife biologist and public use specialist and assistant manager. And that's where I first tried painting out. I, took, I drove 35 miles to the little town of Burns, Oregon, in Harney County. It's a big county with uh, only uh, 10,000 square miles with 7,000 people. So it was pretty underpopulated, except with wildlife. So I went into town, and along with a bunch of ranchers' wives, I took a workshop on acrylic painting, uh, five, five evenings, and that's it. That's my formal training in art, pretty much. But it, it showed me I could do it, and so that was exciting. And then I did my master of science at the University of Arizona in wildlife biology. I studied scaled quail, this cute little bird over here, in the grasslands, the Chihuahuan Desert grasslands. I fell in love with Arizona. I uh, took a scientific, couple scientific illustration classes, which gave me a good background as well. And uh, at that time, my photography had already taken off, so I was selling my photographs in art fairs. But one of the things that I noticed in the art fairs is that how many people skilled it enough at painting, but they didn't know the animals. And it may not be important to you, but if they put a scutellate tarsus on a bird that has a reticulate tarsus, that's frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> So it's one of the reasons I started painting was because I got fed up with the nature fakery of people, you know, copying a photograph and not really knowing what they were looking at. So that's what inspired me to start painting. Then I went on to the University of Michigan, and uh, of course you don't have an awful lot of time to paint when you're in a PhD program. In addition, I taught field ornithology for two summers in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and really loved that. But Unlike Prescott College, where our maximum class size was 12, the first summer I taught field ornithology out there for a couple months in the Upper Peninsula, and I had 38 students and one TA. The second summer I had 54 students and three TAs to do field ornithology. We'd never do that at Prescott College. I mean, what a change, but we didn't know any difference. So anyway, uh, I did art fairs again, and like I said, uh, I was kind of disappointed by the paintings of wildlife that really weren't accurate. Then I had an unusual opportunity to go to the Sutter Buttes of California. It's the world's smallest mountain range. It's the only mountain range in the 400 mile long Central Valley of California. And uh, so it's, it's really an inland island. I have a book over here, one, uh, one of a couple books that I wrote called Inland Island, the Sutter Buttes, because it's isolated out there. It's a, uh, it's a peak of, a series of peaks of upland in a sea of lowland out there in the Central Valley. And so I started an interpretive program there where we'd bring people on guided hikes into private lands. And we took the liability for the landowner, that it, and we paid the landowners. And it really was a successful model of using private lands for public education and interpretation. Build a whole naturalist network there. And it became really the focal point of my life, and it still is. I'm director emeritus of the Middle Mountain Foundation now and still involved in some ways. I co-owned uh, the hanging, whoops, let me go back if I can. Yeah, I co-owned a gallery called The Hanging Judge, and uh, you can sort of figure out that pun. I guess I've been punning for a little while, too. <laughs> and I started leading international trips, first to Alaska, where I had experience working on the Kenai Moose Range, and then uh, to Baja, California, whale-watching trips out of San Diego, 
and then to Africa, and then all this started exploding and going all over the world. So that, that's when that started. And uh, I did the books, as I mentioned, and I started painting in earnest uh, because we had a gallery. We had to have some artwork in there. But that was a tremendous learning experience, as you can imagine. Then I moved to Eugene, Oregon in 1985. And this was kind of a difficult period because I was suffering from a very serious illness and uh, was pretty sick. And we were starting our family at the same time. A lot of things were hitting at the same time. But during that period, as I recovered after major surgery, then I started painting seriously. So some of the paintings that you see or the prints that you see in there or that you'll see in the show were done during the 1985 to 1990 period because 91 is when I came to Prescott College. But uh, here, I was leading international trips, so here's a few examples, Alaska, and Africa, and Brazil. So that'll give you a few examples. Because I was so sick, I think my hair turned from blonde to gray practically overnight. It was interesting. And then uh, the period of time, as Tom mentioned, at Prescott College. I came in 1991 and uh, just uh, retired about a year ago. And so, of course, I was involved in teaching all kinds of courses, like natural history and ecology of the Southwest, wildlife management, wetland ecology and management, and, and many other things. Uh, the upper right picture is when my second book came out, and I'm giving a lecture in California to, uh, at a bookstore. But what a wonderful time to learn with the students, to learn experientially, as we emphasized at Prescott College. And uh, at the same time, of course, I was taking photographs, which has been a a treasure trove of reference material for my paintings, as you can imagine. One of the classes, in fact, the very first class that I taught here uh, when I came in uh, 1991 was called Interpreting Nature Through Art and Photography. I taught that almost every year that I was at Prescott College. As far as I know, there's no other uh, course anywhere like it in the world uh, that I've heard of anyway, where we combined art and photography but chose a theme to interpret, usually a theme that had something to do with conservation. So I always worked with the students, got them to commit to a theme, and then I said, okay, now you've got to, as you're learning all these skills, and there was no prerequisites, as you're learning these skills of drawing and photography, we're aiming to have a show at the end of the term. So we'd always, you can see some examples of the students. The student in the middle at the lower there is actually doing a demonstration during our show. We'd, we'd do a digital slideshow, and they would show, display their artwork as well. It's really pretty amazing. It's uh, certainly one of the most satisfying courses I taught. So though I wasn't really painting myself during this time, I was teaching about art. And I led more ecotours when the opportunity presented itself. Uh, Antarctica, Tom has been there too, with, with one of our former students as, as the organizer of that. Uh, safaris to Africa, in fact, I should mention that I have another one coming up in January, and there's space for you, plenty of space, in fact. A wonderful safari to Africa. Get in touch with me, please, if you're interested, because it's life-changing. You can see a cheetah up there chasing a hare. That's, that was a pretty exciting moment. The hare got away. And it got away by a hare, yeah. <laughs> and one of my students, just before we were being charged by this elephant, we barely got out of there in, in time. So anyway, I also have sort of become a bit of a, an expert on ecotourism internationally. And uh, this fall, I have a chapter coming out in a major wildlife management book on ecotourism and the effects on wildlife. So that was pretty exciting. I, during that time, I did some interpretive ink drawings. Uh, this is a clayboard piece up on the upper left uh, where it's a, a black uh, coated, ink coated uh, board that I scratched all the details. So all the detail in there was actually done with knives and, and steel wool and other things like that. And uh, that took a, uh, an art award in a conference that I went to for field sketching. And then uh, down the lower left is one of the illustrations from the little book called Coexisting with Urban Wildlife, which was published by Charlotte Hall Museum Press. I have a few copies here. And that's a Chihuahua pine illustration I did for somebody else. So I was doing some illustrating. And then the elk in the attic. and. Uh, Chris Hoy was the author of that book. We have some copies up here. It's not an easy book to find because it's, it's not really out in the public much anymore. Oh. Yeah, yeah. But I, but I have copies too, and he has a, he has a garage full. So <laughs> anyway, this was the cover piece for that book over here on this right. And that was a challenge to, uh, to illustrate a, a children's book like this, and so that was a lot of fun to do that. So it's quite an interesting story. I encourage you to read it, and they made a musical out of it. 
Anything? Are you got some that works? Okay. All right. It's a secret. And then I got very involved with local conservation issues. Several of the people on the forum up there are here in this audience. And the Granadelles and the lakes, of course, were very important. I was on water issues committee and open space committees. The Verde River, Gary, the champion of the Verde River is here. Del Rio Springs. We did a lot of interpretation and things like that. So a lot of my time at Prescott College has been devoted, and, and post-grad Prescott College has been devoted to conservation. So art is, is a form of, of helping to assist in conservation, but conservation is the bottom line. So I want to emphasize, and, and it finally struck me, that a naturalist is a storyteller. We try to tell stories that are true to nature. We're not making up things like uh, uh, some of the fairy tales that you may have read or the Just So Stories by Rudyard Kipling. We're not making those kinds of things up. We have to be true, so we have to understand it. But then it's a matter of communicating that to other people. A story artfully told can awaken emotions that result in action, and that's the key. That's what we're trying to do. It's one of the reasons I'm here tonight. I'm going to try to inspire you guys to some action. And it's best served through informed and inspired activism. Oh, gee. My big figures. So first I'm going to mention some of the paintings that I did that were related to the Sutter Buttes, that mountain range that I interpreted, wrote the two books about. So these are some of the paintings that I did with the Buttes in the background. It's an iconic landscape, very similar to the Grand Dells in the sense that it is one of a kind and there's nothing else like it uh, on the planet. You can see it's a circular mountain range 10 miles in diameter and it was all privately owned when I got there. So I worked with the ranchers to get access into there. And then my wife and I ran an art gallery where people would meet and then they would go out and have amazing experience in the field and then come back and buy art, which was really great. It worked out really well. So one of the things I want to emphasize here too as you look at these is that there's intentionality, of course, in anything like this. Uh, for example, uh, think about composition. In all of these cases, the animals have room to move into the picture. It's awkward if I put the heron over here the, the whole thing is unbalanced. You want to have room for the animal, whatever it might be, to move into the pictures and not on that. You also don't want to put it in what they call the dead center. So there are certain places, like if you did uh, two sets of three lines and you divided it that way, there's several points of power. This is a point of power, not a PowerPoint, point of power, another one here, another one here. So that's something else that visually is attractive. And then if you can work in S-curves or leading lines or things like that, then you can be more effective with your art. So those are just some examples of things you should be looking for. Well, the Sacramento Valley is really noted for its uh, wildlife populations. There are many, many wildlife refuges there. And uh, so Ducks Unlimited, which raises money through auctions uh, for acquiring wetlands, mostly in Canada, but also in the prairie pothole states. So Ducks Unlimited has these big uh, wine and beer fests where people get sloppily drunk and buy, spend a lot of money buying art. <laughs> and uh, we decided not to do that tonight. But uh, anyway, it is a really good cause. And so birds like pheasants and ducks, as a wood duck on the right-hand side, those are attractive for bringing in money for conservation. So many, many artists have donated for that sort of thing. As my art career was taking off, I, I won a few awards and uh, didn't really enter much, but I was lucky to win. I went to Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, the, the painting on the left, right here, won Best in Show for Non-Game Birds there. And uh, I felt a little embarrassed because there were really well-established artists who were there who were a little bit jealous that the newcomer like me would win that award, but I was lucky, I guess. I think it was because of this fly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. And then over here, this is watercolor. This is transparent watercolor. And uh, that one was selected for Wildlife the Artist View, which was a show in uh, Wausau, Wisconsin, uh, by the same people who produce Birds in Art. And that was really great. I got to go back there to Wisconsin and meet most of the best top-notch wildlife artists in the world. So that was very inspiring. That was in 1989, two years before I started at Prescott College. And then, uh, as I said, I lead ecotours to Africa and many other places, but Africa is what I'm focusing on most right now. In fact, this uh, last February, I was in uh, Uganda and we saw mountain gorillas. This was done from some I saw in Rwanda, the buffalo. 
Uh, Buffalo painting, the original, is, is in the show over here. And so that gives you some example. But again, look at the composition, because that's what's important. Also, because this is watercolor, you have to kind of work with negative space sometimes. So for example, this egret, there's a little bit of detail, but all that white is the board. It's, I didn't use any white paint on that at all. I used a little bit of, of gouache paint for the highlights here. That's about it. The rest of it's all transparent. And then uh, just kind of notice the shapes and the curves that lead your eyes in. There is no scene like this. There's no photograph like this. I, I created that. I had referenced photos, of course, but I put it all together into a composition. So that's kind of the idea. These uh, two paintings in the upper middle were done for a couple of kids who were on safari with me. The whole family commissioned f four paintings, the two parents and two uh, children. The little daughter, though, was really diabolical. When they were choosing what they were going to have painted, she wanted a guinea fowl. Well, a guinea fowl has these tens of thousands of tiny little white spots that you have to leave if you're doing watercolor. And she knew that. <laughs> I backed out. <laughs> That'd be pretty tough. And then led a, led a lot of trips to Brazil and to the Galapagos Islands as well. So here you can see a few examples. An anhinga with a little capybara back there. Uh, Purple-breasted plover crest, a very rare hummingbird from the highlands of southeast Brazil, which is, there wasn't much reference material, but the challenge here was to get iridescence. So uh, I had, everything I do, I just have to figure it out as I go along, but that's what's fun. And a blue and yellow macaw, uh, and some hyacinth macaws, and then these two are based on Galapagos birds, blue-footed boobies, of course, and swallow-tailed gull. And uh, one of my, uh, I led a trip to Argentina, and the Magellanic Penguin is down there in uh, Tierra del Fuego, or just north of Tierra del Fuego. And so this was an interesting composition. I wanted the rocks to, to be the foil so that the, the wings of the, or flippers, if you want to call them that, of the penguin would stand out. And then the challenge here was to, whoops, I keep hitting the wrong one. Challenge here was to, whoops, just still not there. All right. Challenge here was to show these little water drops thrown up in the air. Lots of water drops and things like that. So that was fun, and little speckles on there. So anyway, a lot of thought goes into these things before you paint them. Uh, sometimes you spend as much time thinking as you do painting, that's for sure, which is a good idea. Think once in a while. And uh, this one was fun, too, because it was all about textures. It's backlighting. You can see the source of light is from behind, so the upper part of the wings there are lit. And then you can see the transparency of the water and uh, reflectivity. And you can see, uh, count all the rocks there, if you would. Every rock is individual. And then, because this is watercolor, you can't just paint them on like you would with, with oil paint. You just paint the grass on there like that. With watercolor, you have to paint all the, whoops, I keep hitting the wrong thing. Sorry about that. Bob warned me about that. All right. But to get these grasses, you have to paint the dark spaces behind so that these come forward. So if you're working in negative space, it's kind of a form of punishment, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was lucky enough to spend, I worked at Mount Here Refuge, which I actually got to ban golden eagles there, which was really fun, climbing down cliffs and things like that. But I spent a, pretty much a full day in a flight cage uh, in Boise, Idaho at the World Center for Birds of Prey with a couple of golden eagles. So I got to really study them in depth and take a lot of reference photos. So here's a couple paintings that resulted from that. Again, the white in the rocks here is actually the paper showing through. So I work all this other stuff around. I'm not painting that on. And so this was a fairly large piece. Not that big, but fairly large. Both of these were. And I don't know why that one picture over there isn't there, but that's all right. This. Uh, this picture doesn't exist anywhere else. This is all created. Uh, I dug up a columbine plant and brought it in the house and studied it so I could draw it. And then as I, I drew it, I worked with the lines. I took a piece of just a, a rough pencil and did these broad lines, just like this shape, this shape. There's some S curves in here. I did all that first to get the composition that I wanted. Then I created the leaves. and things to go with it so that it was composed. I did the hummingbird separately, and then I, I traced it from my original drawing to the board and placed it where it was appropriate for there, so I didn't draw it on that board. But that's how that painting was done. And I don't know where that painting went. 
There's been a thief here. And uh, here's a couple of our favorite uh, wrens that we see out here. In fact, you know, if you're around Prescott, you can see an awful lot of wren species. You know, winter wren, Pacific wren, Buicks wren, house wren, rock wren, canyon wren. We truly live in the high wren district. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, what was important here was doing the textures. The textures on this uh, was, was the goal. And the positioning, too. You notice they're not in the dead center. Now, there's a lot of action in these paintings. The acorn wood deck peckers doing their flash dance and some elf owls landing in an oak. Now, many people who do watercolor, in fact, people don't realize that these are watercolor because they're used to the splashy kind of watercolor, but they are. And many people will put a wash on in the back and then they paint the subject or maybe they mask something else so they can do washes. I do it the painstaking way with a small brush, like all of this dark stuff here was done with a small dry brush after I painted the owls, just little bitty strokes to do that. So it's kind of cruelty, but. And again, look at the composition here. Uh, this was fun, the chickadee with the maple leaves. And I try, you try to get depth in there so that Things don't look like they all just came out of the plant press. <laughs> Lisa Floyd Hannon knows plants, and they're flat. But I try to make my plants three-dimensional and a landing kestrel there. But again, notice how the lines lead you to the subject. All the lines lead you to the subject. A couple more texture pictures. Uh, mountain bluebird on a juniper snag and uh, horseshoes, house, house finch and horseshoes. Again, textures were the goal I was trying, trying to achieve. Tom knows this one on the left very well. The color's a little off here, but uh, red-faced warbler on a bracken fern. Now the fern I did in acrylic and the, and the bird I did in watercolor. So uh, Tom has that in his office up there, and the original. And then the uh, uh, elegant trogon, again, getting iridescence. There's a little moth up there toward the top, up in the sycamore leaves. Northern Spotted Owl and a Cooper's Hawk. Probably the thing to notice here is trying to show the depth in the feathers. Do you see how the feathers overlie each other here and have some shape? That's kind of the key to that particular piece. The Fawn, oh, this one was a, a fun challenge. Actually, both of these are moss pictures, just happen to have other things in there. <laughs> so anyway, uh, what was really fun about this deer one was drawing and, and illustrating the cones to get the Fibonacci numbers right and all that sort of thing. And then on the bed straw that's here, you can't tell it here, and the painting's only about this big, it's not that big, but uh, every little tiny hair on the bed straw is in there. <laughs> it, uh, I didn't wear glasses in those days either. So uh, you gotta be, you gotta, for me, integrity, accuracy is really important. And the Montezuma quail. Montezuma quail used to occur in uh, Granite Dells. The first explorers came out here, and then I think uh, the habitat changed, and uh, they disappeared. But we used to have Montezuma quail all the way up here. They were called Mern's quail in those days. And two of my favorite pictures, the color's a little bit off here, but a vermilion flycatcher with the sycamore roots, and a house sparrow exploring a vacant building. Uh, again, that's sort of an Andrew Wyeth interpretation of a bird, <laughs> I suppose. And uh, again, this... Oh, here we go. Tom, Bob warned me about this. All this dark areas here is actually painted in with a small brush after I had done this and left these things. So it's, it's time consuming. And then here's some paintings that I got done in the 27 years I was in Prescott College. I set it aside for 27 years and almost forgot that I could paint. I did illustrations, a few illustrations. Uh, the only paintings I think I did are the front and back covers of that little coexisting with urban wildlife during that time. So I kind of set it aside because, as Tom can tell you, and Bob can tell you, teaching at Prescott College is pretty all-consuming sometimes. There's a lot of things to do. So there's all my artwork, most of my artwork during those 27 years. And then uh, about two years ago, I had a sabbatical leave. And it was a terminal sabbatical. Maybe that's not the right term. <laughs> I'm still here. But it's sort of like that. And uh, so I was able to pick up painting again during that time. And I'll tell you why in a second. It was because Felipe Guerrero came along uh, from the Highland Center for Natural History. 
And they were going to do a series of five uh, interpretive panels on the Discovery Trail out there at the Highland Center. And he knew that I had painted in the past. He said, could you do the illustrations? So I gulped and said, well, maybe. I mean, he's put me on the spot because he wanted a, quite a number of illustrations. And so my paints were like 30 to 40 years old. I wasn't sure if my paints still worked or if my mind still worked. <laughs> it was kind of an interesting thing. So this right here, and you'll see the originals in there, much, much smaller than this. This, oops, oh God. So used to a different system. Come on. So the, the butterfly on the left was the first one I had done, and I realized I could still paint. Uh, I, it gave me the confidence, and then I did the grasshopper, and then I was off to the races. There's a few more, and something's missing. I don't know where those things go. But anyway, they're gone. Those were birds. There were four birds there. Here are some of the reptiles and amphibians. The one at the top here was a real challenge because I painted this first, and I really wanted to show the cryptic nature of the horned lizard there. But I also wanted to show its prey. And so you'll want to look at the original. It's, it's going to be much more interesting. But there's the ant. And because this is watercolor, I was sweating on this because I'd put many hours into this. And now I'm working on this delicate little thing down here. And if I make a mistake, i got to start all over. Boy, didn't dare make a mistake. And uh, so anyway, it was fun. I learned so much. I'd never painted scales before. And scales are tough. And then the hairs on uh, tarantula. And then the newly emerged cicada. When they first come out, they have that beautiful sort of greenish blue turquoise color. So trying to imply transparency was the challenge. In a, in a day or so, they, they turn brown. And you've probably seen them that way. They're really beautiful. There's some of the mammals. Uh, the top two are watercolor, and the, top, the bottom two are clayboard. And clayboard is a chalk-covered surface that you can ink and then scratch details. So that's what I did on these. So you can see that with two. And then I add a little bit of color. But I want you to look at the javelina up there. That javelina was done, it's very tiny. It's re and that was the challenge. I wanted to paint a javelina no bigger than that, but still get the detail. So I used one brush, not a tiny brush, but a reasonable brush. Because you don't want, if it's, if it's too fine a brush, you can't get enough pigment on there. You have to dip it every time. So you want a brush that has a good tip, but not too tiny. So that's painted with one brush and with one color, except for the little bit of pink on the gland, because when they're excited, they raise that little gland, and perhaps you could smell it. I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyway, there's a leaping javelina. That's when pigs will fly. <laughs> and uh, the white hairs that you see there are all left. That's the board. I didn't use any white paint at all. So that's what's really kind of remarkable about that one. And so these were used by the Highland Center with some of the earlier images, like the golden eagle that you see there, the jackrabbit, which you didn't see, or the burrowing owl, and some of the new ones. And they put them together. Uh, Krista Agostino was the graphic designer who did this. Krista here tonight? No. Anyway, Krista is a brilliant graphic designer and put all these things together with my photographs in the background. So that's my grassland photo back there, and then my illustrations. And they did, uh, Felipe uh, did an excellent job of of writing up the descriptions. There's the chaparral. And uh, Krista, again, she separated the ant, put it over there, because it didn't fit over here. And so she did a wonderful job. There's a wood rat you haven't seen. It's in there, though. There's the woodlands, pinion juniper woodlands, and uh, montane forest. And this is what the displays look like. That's what the actual board looks like out there in the field. It isn't as sharp as the others, because it's taken with some reflection there. but and the riparian riches. So these are beautiful. If you haven't been out to the Discovery Trail at Highland Center, please do so. So that was great. So I had a, a job to get me going again. I was really happy about that. And then Felipe said, well, you know, we'd like to have some butterfly paintings too. Oh, there's another one. Look at how Krista took the, the uh, uh, vermilion flycatcher, turned it around, and put it up there sitting on the map. It's pretty, pretty clever. So anyway. Uh, then they asked me to do some butterflies. So there are, I think, 12, 13 original butterfly paintings in there for you to see. And uh, these are just nine of them. But what a fun project this was. I, you know, when you have to paint something, you really have to get to know it well. You have to look at it much more closely than you would if you were just identifying it. Our left brain just wants to put a name on something, and then we go. But your right brain has to be engaged in order to do this. 
So there's a lot of detail in here. It's obsessive sometimes, but I, that's what I enjoy. And then I got involved with a group called Artists and Biologists Unite for Nature. It's an international group that actually one of my Brazilian friends was a co-founder of. So I found out about it. And I found out they were doing projects to raise money and awareness for endangered species, threatened species around the world. So uh, I decided to join. And the first thing that I did, the first project they were doing was harpy eagle. So I did this portrait of a harpy eagle based on one of Micah's photographs. Some of you know Micah. <clears throat> and then the, another project was Spix's macaw, which is extinct in the wild. And that uh, they're hoping to repatriate it someday uh, to its native habitat, Spix's macaw. So these are raised for, used for raising money. The original of the macaw is in the, uh, in the other room. And then uh, a researcher, wildlife biologist in uh, Mongolia had some, a real big project to raise money for Palace's cat and uh, the snow leopard. And so I did, uh, he had a lot of photographs. One of the things is the artist or the uh, architect of the project sub puts a lot of photographs online that the artist can paint from. He has full permission for them to paint from. So using his photographs, I painted this cute little palace's cat. They have the densest fur because they live in these cold steppes of Mongolia. They're really something. And then the snow leopard as well. So that was a fun project. Then I kind of got interested in cats. And then a project on jaguars in Brazil came up, Iguazu Falls. So I did the jaguar portrait. It's in there. And then, of course, I have this great love for Africa. I couldn't, I was kind of on a cat kick at that point. So I decided to do a lion, lioness. And then I uh, ended up with uh, one that you've seen here. She's got a copy of it right there. And that's uh, my mountain lion, which is based on a photograph I took at the Desert Museum in, uh, in Tucson because it's pretty hard to find a mountain lion posing like that. <laughs> but uh, I also was uh, selected to be a signature artist in this international group called Artists for Conservation. And they're some of the best wildlife artists worldwide. And I get, this was juried into their show. So I'm going up to Vancouver, BC in September to be there at the show. And then this will be in a book. It'll go on tour to China, I think, and maybe elsewhere around the world. And uh, so see it today, because next week I'm shipping it out. And then just for fun, I did an interpretation of uh, one of the storm light. That's, that's actually taken from our house, that picture of that storm light. And so I never used pastels before, so I experimented with pastels. But I changed the colors, and it was fun, but I think there's some potential for pastels, so I might do some more of that in the future. But now I want to bring us back to the conservation idea. I've seen a lot of examples of art. And this we're here in one of the most amazing places in the world with the Granite Dells. And I, I think for many years it was taken for granite or something like that. And people just, well, part of it is because it was privately owned. There wasn't much public access and so forth. But when the Peavine Trail and Iron King Trail went through, people began to go back there and discover what a beautiful place it was. And it is a magnificent landscape. And it's really lucky that uh, the landowners have protected it this long, but it's under threat now. There are development proposals. It's a really diverse ecosystem with rocky outcrops, groves of oaks and pines. And this was taken thanks to the permission on the Storm Ranch, a beautiful spot there. And then Arizona Eco Development has come along in the last few years, is proposing an enormous development. Uh, I'm not sure where eco comes from in there. It, it must mean something different from what I mean with eco because their track record is not good. They put in the Jasper development out in Prescott Valley, and they basically terraformed the place. They blasted the landscape, flattened it out, and packing the houses in over there, planting non-native species. And uh, really, it's, it's not, there's nothing ecological about it. Anyway, Arizona Eco Development purchased a very large ranch, 15,000 acres. And this is a, a view taken from the Peavine Trail. This would fill up with houses and roads uh, by their proposal, obviously. Is not something we want to see. It's a wake-up call. We're so used to walking along the trail and seeing this, and that may be what could happen to it if they get their way. Um, this is the Granite Dells Estates, which is just north, but it's right along the Peavine Trail. And both sides of the Peavine Trail would be surrounded by houses with this development. So it's a, it's a pretty big wake-up call. And here's a view of what's at stake. Uh, Matt Turner took this photo. He is very tall. No. <laughs> <laughs> He actually used a drone. He got up there. So here's where the Peavine Trail 
joins or comes around here from Prescott this way, and then the Iron King Trail leads back into this valley. The proposed resort hotel is back in here. There's roads and everything in this riparian area that would be destroyed. All of this landscape would be turned into houses and roads. And so that's something that we're uh, really trying to uh, pay attention to, and I'll give you some examples of that. So we all recognize there's many values to the Dells. There are certainly economic values because it's the generation, it's a golden goose as far as recreation goes. There are inspirational values, recreational, ecological, and aesthetic. And all of that would be compromised. Look at the herd of cats in the background up there. So this particular view, imagine following, you can actually see in the foreground of the picture is the Iron King Trail. And it leads on back through that valley. Imagine if that was destroyed. It is the most important wildlife habitat left in the Dells. And all this is so unique and precious, we can't lose it. It's a community asset. We have to recognize that we need to take action now or this will be lost. Uh, in 2018, the, the city acquired a, a portion of the Storm Ranch, 160 acres, and it's beautiful. Joe Baines, the Recreation Service Director, said, the Granadelles are unique to the United States, and to be able to preserve this big chunk of land is just monumental. Well, the owners of that land need to be commended because they want to see it as open space instead of development. Some of them are here, but I won't mention their names in, uh, for their privacy. <laughs> but thank you. And it's really true. It's an amazing place. Mayor Mangarelli in Open Forum has said, I think it's important to keep as much open space as possible in the Granite Dells. Uh, it's interesting because the developer, Arizona Eco Development, was his biggest uh, funder for his campaign. So for him to say this, we want to hold him to it for sure. There have been some beginnings. And of course, many people in this world room have been working to protect the Dells. But there's still much to do to complete a vision of a Granite Dells Park and Preserve. Here's a map that's put together by Save the Dells, and it represents, whoops, I keep thinking that I can just click the clicker there. Let me go back. All right. So you can see this blue line sort of indicates the area that's actually the Rocky Dells. This is the perceived idea of a greater Granite Dells Park and Preserve uh, for the lands that are accessible, of course. I'm not going to displace anybody who already lives out there, but the idea is to create a really wonderful regional park system around Prescott, but focused on the Dells. So that's part of the, the dream that many of us have. Proposal for people, wildlife, and our communities. I want to draw a distinction there. Uh, some people are confused because there's two groups with the Dells in the names, at least two groups that are active in conservation. One is the Granite Dells Preservation Foundation, which is a nonprofit that was founded back in 2010. And it's dedicated to preserving the scenic and ecological integrity of the Dells through fundraising, education, and collaborative stewardship, working toward a greater Granite Dells park and preserve by acquiring undeveloped land. So it has a long-range goal of acquiring land. It, this, is, this organization is going to be here for a while because it's going to take a while to do that. On the other hand, the Political Action Committee Save the Dells is, uh, was founded in 2017. Is that the right date? Did I get that right? OK, 2017. And it's focused on this threat from Arizona Eco Development, the AED annexation process. And it's really become a force. Thousands of people are on the mailing list, and thousands of people are showing up. Uh, it's really, people care about the Dells. And so it's really wonderful to see this. We've never seen a conservation movement like this in this town ever. Well, it was 2016. Oh, I was afraid of that. Yeah. 2016. We okay. Became a okay, that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. All right, good. So anyway, the uh, Arizona Eco Development is required as part of the annexation process of planned area development of putting, setting aside 500 acres, or 25%, I should say, as open space, dedicated open space. We just want that open space to be where it serves the public and the wildlife best, which is right along the Peavine and Iron King trails at the junction out there by uh, Point of Rocks. It's not just the rocks. There's a precious valley out there that is the most important wildlife habitat. So that's the distinction between the two. One's a nonprofit and the other one is a political action committee, and they're working hand in hand to try to save the Dells. So uh, Save the Dells has uh, really mounted a successful uh, social media campaign, and uh, these are just a few examples of the uh, materials that they put out there. They call them memes today, <laughs> but uh, I have a different definition of the word meme. But anyway, here, Marshall Trimble, who's sort of the official state historian, wrote, once a place of such natural beauty is developed, it's gone forever. So we're quoting him. 
Dear City Council, what is going on with your negotiations with Arizona Eco Development? Sometimes we don't know. Guess what? And there's my Peregrine Falcon uh, trying to provide a little bit of voice for the Dells. Another opportunity. So these are, are many, many examples of the publicity that's going out there to try to get people to get inspired, take action, and make a donation. And then uh, the Grand Dells Preservation Foundation, several people, several of us work together to produce uh, Prescott's Granite Dells, and we have some copies of it here. We are giving this as a premium to people who donate at least $60 to the Dells Foundation, or Save the Dells, either one. And uh, they have different purposes and, and certainly different uh, uh, functions. So there's some examples, and please take a look up here. If any of you like to donate tonight, I can take your check. Uh, we also did a series of postcards, 12 postcards, and I didn't bring any of those tonight, but uh, there's nine of the images of the postcards. This place is scenic. It's photogenic, for sure. Then, coming back to ABON, Artisan Biologists Unite for Nature. After 26 projects for endangered species worldwide, they decided to shift to a threatened landscape, the Granite Dells. They spent three and a half months, artists from all over the world, doing artworks. About 200 artworks have been done so far, some of which will come here to us that we can use in an auction in October to raise money toward acquisition in the Dells. So this is really exciting, the first threatened landscape in the world that they focused on, and it's the Dells. So very, very exciting. And you see our sponsors, Save the Dells and the Grand Dells Preservation Foundation. <clears throat> For a while, we uh, had this little Ruby the Ringtail over here as a mascot, and Ruby the Ringtail did these uh, sort of really interesting, uh, I don't know what you would call it. It's not claymation, but it's stop, it's motion. stop motion animation. Really time consuming to do, but Ruby was very charming and she helped make some friends for the Dells. And uh, she was heartbroken when her Randy the Pronghorn was uh, transplanted down to Wilcox. Anyway, October 12th is the date of our auction. Grand Highlands Hotel in Prescott. We will be selling tickets for entry and we're hoping to get a lot of people there to come out and contribute uh, and get some art in return. And so I'm gonna show you some examples of that. We need to have your help. So here, for example, are some ex of the art contributions that I've seen so far. Just a few examples, many different interpretations. You can probably see this uh, elephant up in here. A couple elephants, actually. Maybe three elephants. If you're not, ima that's, that's called informed imagination. They used to be here, those mastodons. And then some of the wildlife. This is my little woodpecker on the lower left. But some of the other examples of wildlife, there's some really fun stuff. So we really hope that you'll come out. And we'll also have online auctions after, or online sales afterwards for prints and other things like that. Marion Schoen is the coordinator from Germany. And I work with her. That's my first pastel piece, that owl I didn't, with chalk. I didn't know if I could do it. But that's my first pastel piece, the owl. And so that was fun. I'll be there. Sylvia Schmidt did these calliope hummingbird and uh, uh, coyote. Here's a couple examples of American uh, ladies. I guess most of you are. <laughs> and then uh, Bill Kramer, who is a really well-known uh, painter here in town and at the Fippin Show and Fipping Museum, has donated this large oil painting, which we hope will bring in a really good price for us. And Raina Gentry, another local artist, did a real tiny piece. It's beautiful. Those are some examples. Di Roberts created this diorama of uh, different animals here. And the auction's gonna be October 12th at the Grand Highlands, so watch for nos notices on that. The word will be getting out. So I provided that one photo in the middle there, the upper middle of a monsoon storm light, and five different interpretations of that in paintings. And uh, again, Sna, this German guy, he had to put uh, the elephant in there. <laughs> Another elephant over here. <laughs> He's really good at elephants. <laughs> he sees elephants in rocks. So uh, anyway, all different interpretations of this one photo. So I just want to emphasize, art is a tool we can use to help save the Dells. It's an alternative voice. It appeals through emotions rather than logic. And that's one of the things I really want to try to communicate, is that we tend to be more responsive to our emotions than we are facts. We know that politically, too. 
So to destroy this would be to demolish a living art museum, a source of inspiration, and ecological services. Keeps our air clean, our water clean. And it's not as some of the council have said, oh, we're going to save the rocks. It's not just about the rocks. We're trying to save an ecosystem. We're trying to save that riparian area that's so important for wildlife corridors and so forth. So there will be opportunities for you to contribute. Uh, coming up in the next few months, we're going to have uh, hearings at Planning and Zoning and at the City Council. And it's really important that our elected officials and their staff hear what we want to see in our future. And that is really what we're trying to do. We're trying to convince them to get the best deal for people, for wildlife, and community. We, this, here, we, another view of the gorgeous valley that comes in here, which would have a, by their plan, would have a road underneath the Peavine Trail on the right, right up through those cottonwoods up the middle of that channel, which is a floodplain where the water rushes last summer. It was major floods in there. But that's the plan. We're hoping that we can persuade the council to insist that this all become public open space. Because we must. So that's the message I want to leave for tonight. Let's use art uh, in all its various forms and activism to help save our precious granite dells. We need your help. So thank you very much. We'll take just a couple questions, and then uh, anybody who wants to stay later and ask more questions can do so. We really want to invite you to go into the gallery and look at the artwork there. The show will be up until October 11th. The hours for the show here at the Natural History Institute are Tuesday through Friday, 11 to 4. And uh, probably it will be open on the fourth Friday art walks, too. So if you have an opportunity to come then, I was at the last one. I'll try to be at the next one. The third one, though, I'll be in uh, Canada, so I won't, I'll miss that one. But, uh, and then take a look at the books if you like, and uh, uh, I can be a cashier if anybody wants to buy a book there. But the, the uh, uh, Natural History Institute is selling the paintings and prints, so help yourself. So a couple questions. Anybody have a Well, she asked how long it took to, take, to paint the mountain lion painting. You know, that's an impossible question, because an artist has to spend his or her whole life developing the skills and the vision and things like that. So, uh, <laughs> over 70 years? <laughs> Something like that. The actual painting is just a part of it. So, but I'm a pretty fast painter though. Yes? Thank, thank you very much for asking that. We had a meet, committee meeting today, and we would love to see more local artists contribute. And actually, we're going to solicit art from local people as well as the international. So it won't be strictly an Artists and Biologists Unite for Nature event. It will be an art event that celebrates the Dells. And so we are definitely excited about local artists who would contribute. And originals, all the better, because that's going to get us money in the auction. So thanks. That's a wonderful question. And she can help you, because... That's a great one. So somebody back there? Yeah. Do you Well, that's certainly a possibility. We haven't discussed it. It's, uh, it's, it's a possibility. <laughs> so yeah, that's, I've done it at the Highlands Center years, years ago. And uh, of course, I taught that interpreting nature class. So uh, it sounds like Tom and I might have something to talk about. Right. I think we'll cut it off there so that those who would like to have some time in the gallery. Uh, yeah.